reading appointed for Septuagint Jesus on 70 days before Easter. From Exodus chapter 17, all the congregation of the people of Israel moved on from the wilderness of sin by stages, according to the commandments of the Lord, and camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people quarreled with Moses and said, Give there was water to drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock of Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah, because of the quarreling of the people of Israel, and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. Reading from 1 Corinthians 9 and 10. Do you not know that in a race all runners compete? but only one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. A reading from Matthew chapter 20, Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers in the vineyards. After agreeing with the laborers for the various sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and to them he said, You, go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will do. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired first, they thought they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius, and on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? So, 
Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. O Lord, have mercy on us. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. place. 
Whether we know exactly where Horeb is or not, only God can cause this miracle to happen. It comes from God. Indeed, Jesus tells the Jews in John 6, it wasn't Moses that brought forth man from heaven. Likewise, it wasn't Moses who brought forth water from the rock, but it was your father. And so notice, early on in the text, it is God saying, I will be there. I'll go before you, Moses, and I will be on the rock. In the Hebrew, the preposition on or in is the same letter. So it could be that God's standing on the rock just like he's on Mount Sinai. Or it could be that God goes ahead of them to be in the rock, in the horror. Now that's kind of interesting, right? That's not just Moses striking a rock, right? Because... <coughs> By and large, probably not actually the rock that's held that water since creation, but it could be that Moses is actually, well, striking God in the rock. Now that seems to make a lot more sense, for it's God who created the river of life in the beginning, God who brings forth all waters and created the earth to be water in the very beginning. Indeed, as we'll hear at the end of the sermon, it is Jesus who is called the river of life. The source of the water is God. Now, I really encourage you, Christian, to soak that up, right? Because as you're going day in and day out, we live in a world that's full of law, that's full of you get what you earn, right? Right? Or maybe if you're good enough, people will repay the favor that you have already given to them. But here are the grumbling, mumbling Hebrews who don't deserve a thing. They're not just giving a faithful prayer, we are thirsty, God. Lord, have mercy, God. I am hurting, God. That is a good prayer, trusting in God's grace. But the Hebrews are saying, we don't want what you have, God. We want to go back to Egypt, God. And they're even asking Moses to do all these things. Your Christian, I hope that you find the source of God's grace is in Jesus. When God wants to be gracious to us, he looks not to you, what favor you've dished out, what work you've done, what over and above you have done for others, but he looks to Christ. We end Matins, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And we make the sign of the cross. Because Christ's cross is given for you. God is gracious to you wherever you go. Find then in this reading a beautiful foretelling of what Christ will do for us on the cross. For Hebrews tells us that by a single sacrifice, not by all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, but by a single sacrifice, God is gracious to us. Not by all the works of the prophets done in the Old Testament, no, by Jesus on the cross. We hear Paul tell us this plainly. That rock was Christ. Not Moses, not someone else, not someone's money, not someone's offering. God is gracious to those Hebrews long ago because of Jesus. So Moses strikes the rock once, and water flows. But as God, 40 years later, tells Moses again to bring forth water from the rock, he is not to strike. For Christ only was crucified once, sacrificed once. That one perfect man, perfect God, on the cross, is all we need. Just Jesus. There is where God's grace is found. And so, like that soldier who took the spear and pierced Jesus' side, and out flowed blood and water. So also Moses strikes the rock once, and forth comes the water 
so that millions of Hebrews, undeservedly, sinners can drink. I would absolutely, I'd ask you to look at 1 Kings 19, where God brings forth the other prophet we heard last week on the Mount of Transfiguration, not just Moses, but Elijah, comes to Horeb. And he is not supposed to find faith in his own striking of the rock, but there at Horeb, Elijah finds God, not in the sweet, <laughs> not in the fire, not in the storm, not in the earthquake, but in the whispering word. When God brought forth water the second time, it was simply by the word of Moses. Christ is crucified on the cross once, but henceforth it is by God's word that he makes himself known. Not by a re-sacrificing or a re-offering of Jesus' body and blood. It is not the priest's work, the pastor's work, or your work that God is gracious to you today. But by the word of God, he brings forth water and blood given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. You see how God is gracious to the Hebrews long ago through Christ and is gracious to us here today, years removed from that cross, and yet we still receive the free favor of God we did nothing to deserve. Oh, how beautiful this is found all over in the scriptures, so much so that when Jesus is risen from the dead, and doubting Thomas starts wondering, is Jesus really risen? Can I trust that my Lord lives? So Jesus appears before him in flesh and blood and tells him to thrust his hand into his side. As if to say, put your hand into the very rock of Horeb. That hundreds of years ago, granted life to your fathers in the wilderness. Dear Christian, when we come and approach the very altar of God, it is the rock of Horeb. It is that miraculous rock where Christ was that saved our faithful fathers long ago. And it is this rock today that saves us by God's grace. So, I beg of you then, consider what a miracle it is that we find ourselves in the very presence of God, where Christ is, where he gives us a life-giving water and blood. What if you could see that rock that split, split open could pour forth enough water so that millions could drink? What a spectacle, right? What a miracle. It is that very rock that you see here every time we see a baptism that speaks the word of Christ. It is that very rock you see every time you receive the Lord's Supper that speaks the word of Christ. It is that miracle that you hear every time you hear the words of absolution, Jesus' own words. Whatever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Dear Christians, then, Increase your faith upon this rock. As Psalm 81 says, suck it out as honey from the rock. How sweet is it? Better than lemonade or sweet iced tea, your favorite soda, Coke. Here in the cup of the Lord is the grace of God that changes your whole life. You find here God's grace for you for all your days. God points you to not something else, but the very word and means by which he, Jesus, comes in flesh and blood. To understand this a little better, look at the context of what the Hebrews were doing in the wilderness. After God delivered them from the Red Sea, from the Egyptians, he leads them out into the desert where they get thirsty. And they come upon bitter waters where Moses just throws in a log and they become sweet enough for the Hebrews to drink. They completely relied on God's grace. 
They didn't just happen upon a body of water. God led them to where he would graciously feed them. So then, later, God does lead them to an oasis. It's called Elam in Exodus 15. There, they do find 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, right? This is the mirage in the desert that's never true, but it is. This is your dream as you're starving in the desert. You come upon 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And God lets them leave that oasis and brings them out to the desert, Horeb, which could also mean dry, where there's nothing. There's sand, and there's rock, and there's dirt. And that is where he points the Israelites. That he himself will feed them. Whether it's bread from heaven every day or water from a rock. God feeds them. You, dear Christian, ought see that all blessings flow from your Lord, and thus return in graciousness to everyone who does either good or ill to you, the co-worker who shorts you at work, the person who cuts you off in traffic, the person who has to get to where they're going so as to make you late. God tells you to be gracious to them. Luther teaches in the fifth petition, we pray every time we say forgive us our trespasses, we mean Surely we sin much and deserve nothing but punishment. But we ask God would give us everything by his grace. So we too will sincerely do good to those who sin against us. Finding in God pure graciousness in Christ Jesus, we turn around and are gracious to others. Not because they owe us, not because it will make God more pleased with our lives, but because it honors the grace and trusts in the grace that freely comes from God. Jesus teaches, upon happening a, upon a little one, let's say a child, who is a believer in Christ, that you yourself should delve out a cup of cold water. Now maybe the uh, analogy of the desert works a little better because a cup of cold water isn't what everyone's asking for this morning. Maybe a cup of hot tea. But all Jesus is teaching us is that we have very little to give. Where God brings forth a river from a rock, we have merely a cup. And whatever that cup holds, that little bit is from God's gracious hand. But see what beauty extend to others who are cared for by the grace of God through you. Each of us have our own hours and hours of stories to tell where others were kind to us when we did not deserve it. Whether it's our, our grandparents continually giving us that strong advice through life that we didn't take notice until we wised up whether it's our parents who lovingly cared for us year in and year out of our teenage mumbling and grumbling, whether it's someone in the church who extends to us a kind word when we are suffering day in and day out. Consider all the grace that has been extended to you from your brothers and sisters in Christ. And consider how God uses you to share that grace with others. So then, dear Christian, don't be confused at all that just because of this grace we are automatically saved. For Hebrews and Paul tells us that this generation in the wilderness provoked God, and in unbelief they did not enter the rest, but rather perished. We hear this over in the Old Testament again and again, so that we know, yes, God grants grace, but it is ours to believe, to trust, and to receive. Those fathers rejected the promised land and didn't receive it. So you receive the grace of God, knowing in Christ all blessings flow. The Bible ends with this statement. In the last chapter of the Bible, we hear of John seeing 
the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. The river of life comes from the Lamb of God. The last words of the Bible end thusly, the grace of our Lord Jesus be with you all. This is God's dismount in the Bible. That he lands on the grace in Christ, which we see all throughout the Holy Scriptures, and which you yourself trust every day. Only by the grace found in Christ Jesus are we saved. So then, as the world becomes more bitter to our souls, Christ becomes sweeter and sweeter, and we are to love this grace and live by it every day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let our eyes.
suffer the consequence of our sin, may be mercifully delivered by your goodness to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Gracious God, though we deserve nothing but punishment for our sin, you richly and daily provide for all of our needs of body and soul. Give us faith to offer whatever gifts you granted to us, the first fruit of our tithes, even while we are suffering, to share what you have given to us with our neighbors. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, you give to us pastors today as you did Moses and prophets in the past, as instruments of your word that many would be baptized, exalt, and receive the sacrament of the altar. Help us to trust your word to see in those sacraments the means of your presence, gracious forgiveness, and gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious God, you give us bodily life and it is good. We thank you for all mothers with child and all families, including Harry and Sandra Brash upon their anniversary. Grant to all people the knowledge and respect of your precious life in the gift of husband and wife to make us bold to defend both marriage and our littlest neighbors in the womb. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, you have granted your mission here to Bethlehem, and we as your saints are recipients of your goodness. So grant us to boldly support the mission of your word and sacrament in our central Illinois district, and the missions that you lead, in order that many would be brought to the truth of your word, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Gracious God, we pray for the nations of the world, the justice, peace, and the common good of all would be the goal for all those in authority. So we pray for our president, our Congress, and all our leaders to lead and guide us with truthful legislation and practice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Gracious God, many are suffering. We pray for Jim, Tiffany, Ebony, Bernice, Janice, Zoe, Vivi, Lorraine, Caleb, Barb, Susie, Charlie, Karen, Phyllis, Jen, Gary, Craig, Paul, and many others. That those who thirst in the body for relief would be granted righteousness in the soul. And upon receiving and hearing your word of promise, they would face whatever trials you allow to befall them for their good, through faith in Christ Jesus. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gracious God, many have gone before us, even as they trudged the wilderness and were brought to the promised land, so we pray for all the faithful who have gone, that we would be brought to share with them the feast of joy and find in the Lamb of God the rock which brings forth all blessings. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, May be righteous in your sight, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 